Hi class, uh, this week we're going to talk about the development of life on Earth, uh, how it initially formed and how it changed over time and got into the state it is today. We're going to use that as our motivation for what we should initially look for as we start looking outward uh, into the solar system and ultimately into the much larger cosmos and we'll start that discussion um, next week. So today, uh, where we're going to start is we're going to talk about the early Earth. So you can see that in the image behind me. Uh, the early Earth was a very different sort of place. Uh, the early solar system was rather violent. There were lots of uh, bombardments and collisions with stuff uh, uh, impacting the Earth all the time. That causes all kinds of damage to the Earth, lots of volcanic activity, as you can see. But over time, the things that we're used to, like the water and the atmosphere, develop. So so that's what we're going to talk about today uh, here in this first part of the lecture. The second part of the lecture will talk a little bit about the chemistry of the Earth and how it changed and how it set the stage for life. Um, so on uh, Wednesday, then we can talk about uh, the early forms of life and how we know what it looked like and how we think it changed and evolved over time. Okay, so I'm going to start with a few slides here. Um, Okay, so the early Earth did not look like the Earth does today. Uh, when you look at the Earth today, certainly the continents weren't the same. We're not going to talk about geology and uh, uh, all of plate tectonics and all of that stuff, at least only in passing when we do. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, the early Earth, when it uh, had finally started developing life, it did have a hydrosphere, that is a collection of water that was associated with it, and it also had the atmosphere, that thin blue layer that you always see. Uh, associated with the clouds and, and everything above the earth. Okay, and uh, so the question is, what did it look like before all of that happened? And then how did it actually get to that state? So what we'll do today is um, I'll just remind you or I'll tell you just a little bit about the nebular origin of the solar system. Uh, we'll come back to that when we talk about exoplanets in a couple of weeks and talk about it in a lot more detail, but I'll just give you the basics today. We'll talk about the early phase of the Earth's life, what we call the early bombardment, um, and then we'll finish off this portion of the lecture with the discussion of how did the Earth acquire its volatiles, where by volatiles we mean things that are easily lost to space, like the atmosphere and the water that we enjoy today, okay? So this is arguably uh, one of the most famous pictures of Earth from the space age. Uh, this is called the Blue Marble. This particular one was taken by the Apollo 17 astronauts on their way back from the moon in 1972. Um, what I like to remind people is that this image is widely recognized virtually every person on the planet. If you show this to them, they know what you're looking at. Okay, but despite that fact, no human has ever seen this except the Apollo astronauts who went to the moon. All the other astronauts in history who have been uh, in Earth orbit on space stations, they are never far enough away from the Earth to see the Earth with this view. The only people who have seen the Earth this way with their own eyes are the Apollo astronauts, okay? So that's, uh, that ties back into that earlier discussion we had in uh, the class where we were talking about the fact that the universe is much bigger than we uh, normally think about. We're used to having it explained to us and kind of not really thinking about the vast scales involved, but there are only 24 people total who have ever seen the Earth look this way with their own eyes, okay? Now, more to the point, uh, this is a image, it was the first image of the Earth and Moon taken together. Okay, so we often think of the Earth and the Moon and we talk about it and we draw pictures of them together in space all the time, uh, but it wasn't until 1977 when Voyager 1 was outbound for Jupiter uh, that it turned its cameras back and was able to see the Earth and Moon together hanging in space as a single system. Okay, so this is before most of you were born, but it was certainly after I was born. Uh, it's in with recent memory that we finally have this kind of cosmic view of our planet and our home, okay? But I, I bring this up because the moon and the earth are good for comparison to talk about uh, the early structure of the planet, and we'll come back to that in just a minute. So the solar system, all the planets in the solar system, formed uh, from what we call the protosolar nebula. 
Okay, so the current understanding of how planets form is that when the star first condenses out of its initial stellar nursery, the gravity of the protostar gathers tremendous amounts of material around it. That material typically is spinning, and as it spins, it flattens out like a pancake or a pizza crust that you're spinning over your head when you're making pizza during the pandemic. Okay, and that disk is where all the planets and everything form. Uh, typically what happens is small pebbles or rocks, uh, uh, small condensations of material um, have a little bit more gravitational influence than everything else around them. They attract more things to them, that makes them grow. They grow into what are called planetesimals, these little dots that you can see here embedded in the cloud. And over time, those planetesimals eventually collect enough material that they become what we call what we call the planets okay so gravity basically causes the planets to accumulate okay now what happens you see those gaps forming we'll come back to that and talk about that when we talk about exoplanets but the real thing that happens is that even though the planets themselves form they don't gather everything up Right? It's a bit like when you're cooking in the kitchen and you're making you know, cookie dough or something or you're rolling out a pie crust. You get most of the flour into the pie crust, but there's still all kinds of other stuff flying around. And so in this time, even though the plants were condensing, there were lots of big and small rocks floating around in the solar system. And what that means then is in the early days of the solar system, the first 100 million years or so, was a period that we called the heavy bombardment. And that time, much as you see here in this picture, was a time when every world in the solar system was being pelted by all of these leftover rocks and, and asteroids and whatnot that was left over in the solar system. Okay, and we still see evidence for that today if we look around at the various worlds in the solar system. So here are just three examples. On the left here is the planet Mercury, the planet closest to the sun. You can see its surface is heavily cratered. Everywhere we look on Mercury, we see craters. This was taken, this image was taken by Mercury Messenger. Uh, Mercury was unmapped. Uh, until just the last decade uh, when we sent Mercury Messenger to Mercury to finally map out the solar system. It was one of the last worlds in the solar system to be visited uh, multiple times by spacecraft, okay? Uh, in the center there is our own moon Luna. So uh, the bright crater you see right there near the center of the image is called Aristarchus, and the rather large crater up there at the top is called Copernicus. Uh, you can see this uh, if you go out in your backyard, if you have a pair of binoculars, uh, or you can go out to your apartment balcony, uh, stay socially distanced from everyone. But if you just look through binoculars, you can see these kinds of craters on the surface of the moon. Okay, and then lastly, over here on the right, this is Saturn's moon Dione, and Dione, as you can see, also has a very heavily cratered surface. So we look at all of these planets like this. These are all worlds without atmospheres. So the craters, when they form, they persist over millions, if not billions of years. And so when we look at this, this is our evidence for there being an early, very heavy period bombardment in the solar system. Now, an overtly skeptical person, or a person who's thinking carefully about what I just said, might ask, well, how do I know all those craters formed in the early solar system? Well, the way we do that is we look at the craters that appear, we count them up, and we organize them by size. It's kind of like taxonomy, just like we did uh, when we talked about the taxonomy of life. We bin up the craters and we count how many are big ones and how many are medium ones and how many are small ones and how many are tiny ones, okay? And what we know is that big ones occur less often than tiny ones, okay? So how do you explain that? Well, that has to do with the way the rocks form in the early solar system. But by and large, big pieces are far less common than small pieces. How does that make sense? Well, think about if you dropped a plate, okay? If you broke a plate up, that's the reverse process of what's going in the solar system, breaking things up instead of creating things. But it's, it's, it's the same sort of physics. If you break a plate, what you're left with is a few big pieces, a handful of medium pieces, and gazillions of tiny, tiny shards. Okay, so that's just kind of the scaling of the way things work in terms of size in the universe, is that big things are rare, small things are very common, because it takes a lot of material to make big things, and it doesn't take very much material to make small things. 
Okay, so if I make a whole bunch of asteroids, rocks in the solar system, I have a few large ones, quite a few medium ones, and quite a lot many small ones. And if I'm then pelting planets with all of those rocks, there will be a few big craters, there'll be a lot of medium craters, and a gazillion small craters caused by the large, medium, and small rocks. And so that's what we see happening on the uh, surfaces of worlds like Mercury, Venus, and the Moon, is we see big craters, medium craters, and small craters. And in particular, what you see is the big craters often have small craters inside them. Okay, and that is because if you look there on Mercury, uh, right there in the center, there's a big crater, and inside it, there's a couple small ones. Well, that's because the big ones, they formed long, long ago, and then small ones happen to form on top of them as time wears on, because there's lots of small ones that help the planets. Okay, so we can age the planetary surfaces by counting the craters, counting how many overlap, and indeed, we can convince ourselves that all this happened a long time ago in the early solar system, okay? Okay, now on the early Earth, there were no oceans, there were no continents, uh, so there was nothing to erase craters. So just like those worlds we were just looking at, the Earth was being bombarded. It was a constant barrage of uh, impacts from all the rocks floating around, um, and that caused uh, a very heavily cratered, molten, volcanic, active surface, not unlike the picture that you see here, okay? And that's all caused completely by the fact that the solar system had a lot of stuff dropping around it. The Earth was uh, also attracting stuff because its gravity was strong enough, and that slowly accumulated uh, lots of impacts on the surface of the Earth, okay? Now, most importantly, during this era, one of the things that happened was there was an enormous impact uh, with a large body called Thea, okay? And that body was about the size of Mars. It was, as kind of demonstrated in this artist's impression, a kind of glancing blow with the Earth, and a lot of the material and the remains of Thea and a lot of the bits that came off of the Earth uh, coalesced and uh, ultimately formed our own moon. Okay, so this has been uh, a matter of much debate for a long, long time, but this is the uh, story that we've arrived at to explain the very interesting and odd properties uh, that the moon has, especially compared to the Earth. Okay, but uh, if you look at the geology of the Earth and the moon, they're similar, uh, and this seems to be uh, the, the most logical explanation for what happened. Okay, so that happened about 50 million years after the formation of the Earth. So this is very, very early on uh, in the size, in the age of the solar system during this uh, very heavy bombardment phase. Okay, so you form the planet, you form all of these uh, uh, craters, right? You're just constantly beating down the planet. Uh, a lot of material was delivered probably by this uh, impact by Thea, but the Earth was accumulating and changing over time. So the question is, is how do you go from this kind of molten, volcanic, kind of constantly bombarding, constantly being destroyed world that the early sun was, uh, early sun was, the early earth was, and evolved to the earth that we see today, where we have a comparatively placid environment, we have volatiles, rocks, air, and so, uh, uh, air and water, and so on. Okay, and so uh, this has been a big mystery for a long time. The question is, where did it all come from? Well, it also came to the Earth during this period of bombardment, okay? So, if you look around us today, we think there's, uh, especially uh, from our perception as humans, right? You just go out in our backyard and there's a gigantic lake, Lake Michigan right there here in Chicago, okay? But we think there is a lot of water and a lot of air on Earth, and that's completely natural as life forms were completely dependent on all of the water and all of the air on Earth. Okay, but how much is there really, right? If we're trying to understand how the Earth grew and changed and was developed in those early phases, we need to know how much water do we have to get or do we have to make on the early Earth, okay? Well, and as it turns out, there's actually not that much water, okay? So this is one of my favorite graphics in astronomy is if you take all the water on Earth and bundle it up into a sphere and then hold it next to a sphere that's all the solid stuff on Earth, okay, and you can still see the continents there and the ocean floors there, it's not that much water by comparison to the size of the Earth, 
Okay, the hydrosphere, the collection of all the water of Earth, okay, is very tiny. If you mass it all out, it's only about 10 to the 21 kilograms. That's about 1 hundredth the total mass of everything on Earth, or about 0.02%. Okay, so there's a lot, lot of water on Earth from, from our perspective, but from a geologic perspective, from the perspective of forming a planet, you don't have to have that much water at least by comparison to the, the mass of the rest of the planet. So where did it come from? Well, the place we think it came from is still in the uh, era of bombardment. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about uh, formation of planetary systems next week. But uh, in addition to the worlds that formed, lots of the gases in the protosolar nebula condensed and froze into what we call ices. Okay, so that's, that's not water ice, it's a generic term for any frozen volatile. So like CO2 is called dry ice, okay, that's an ice, water ice, okay, and so on. So these ices co uh, condensed and also uh, gathered around small rocks and uh, grains of dust and all kinds of stuff in the solar system. Today we call those small icy bodies comets. Okay, and there are trillions of them in the solar system out beyond the orbit of Pluto. Uh, but in the early solar system, there were lots of them that had formed out beyond what we call the snow line. They had frozen, and just like all the asteroids and the rocks and everything that were floating around and bombarding the planets, there were comets that also were drawn in and eventually impacted many of the planets. And so the current belief our current estimate is that much of the volatiles that we have on Earth came from this kind of bombardment, okay? Now, exactly how much and how often we had these impacts, how big they were when they hit us, did any of this come from Thea when it hit us, all of these kinds of questions are still areas of very active research. We don't know the answers to this. But given the composition of the Earth, given what it's comprised of, given the way this early solar system formed, the only way to get the volatiles onto the Earth is through these kinds of processes. Now, our understanding of that is slowly changing and will slowly change over the course of your lifetime as we begin to observe extrasolar planets and the formation of uh, other planetary systems. And that is something that's just started in the last 10 years or so. And we'll come back to that when we talk about exoplanets next week. Okay? Okay, so that's all I'm going to say for this part of the lecture. So this is kind of the early framework for where the Earth came from. And so this is the environment where the earliest forms of life are going to ultimately take hold, right, is the kind of early Earth. And so that's why we want to introduce it. And so we'll talk a little bit about the early chemistry in the next half. And then uh, next class, we'll, we'll talk about the early forms of life. Okay? So that's all I'm going to say now. Uh, hope you're all having a great day and taking care of yourself. I'll see you in the next part of the lecture.